Good evening and welcome to the Week in Review. I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you for joining us on this sweltering Friday evening. It was a busy week in the courts. Four cops accused of covering up for Jason Van Dyke in the shooting of Laquan McDonald are fired by the police board. A judge sentences Brent Christensen to life in prison. A jury is unable to decide on a death sentence for the killing of Chinese scholar Yingying Zhang at the University of Illinois. R. Kelly held without bond after prosecutors accuse him of having sex with 7th and 8th grade girls. He faces more charges in New York. Mayor Lori Lightfoot and Cook County Board President Tony Preckwinkle step up their feud over city violence. Five possible casino locations proposed by the mayor are surprising some aldermen. Chicago overcome with heat and humidity. And in sports. Until now, it's deep and it is gone. Cubs lead on the grand slam by Rizzo. The Cubs take a comfortable lead in the Central Division. Joining us are Heather Sharon of the Daily Line, Gregory Pratt of the Chicago Tribune, Laura Washington of the Chicago Sun-Times and ABC7 News, and Xavier Pope of Forbes.com. Let's get right into it. Heather Sharon, with this firing of four cops accused of lying or falsifying statements in the Laquan McDonald case, is this the end of everything having to do with Laquan McDonald, at least the legal wranglings? It, it may be. Um, this is just a case that has reverberated for really years, and I wouldn't expect the political ramifications to end anytime soon. Uh, we're still looking for a new police contract. The consent decree that is a direct result of the death of Laquan McDonald is just now going into effect. So while these officers may have been fired by the police board, I think there's more fallout still to come. Greg Pratt, there was a case several months ago where other officers were found, they were acquitted basically of of covering up. Uh, why, why were these officers found at least guilty enough to be fired? Well, it's a different standard, right? There's the, there's the Cook County Court and then there's where officers are rarely if ever found guilty of crimes and then there's there's the police board and I think for the police board the politics of that are just too too hard you know the the Laquan McDonald case changed everything mm -hmm. and so at some point this is gonna continue to reverberate maybe legally it's over it, it seems like that although who knows what happens but but the politics will continue you know we will have to deal with the issue of civilian oversight of the police department which Lori Lightfoot has said she's for and might come up again. Yeah, th th there's a couple different proposals on that. Laura Washington, um, is this result uh, going to satisfy the community that's been so upset uh, um, at some of the results here? No, I don't think so. I think the, the community has been upset for a long time. They, they were unhappy about Jason Van Dyke's sentence. They were unhappy about the officers who were acquitted. I think many people see this as at least some modicum of justice, and maybe this is setting the stage for a, ch a change in terms of how police officers who do wrong are, are, are treated. It's extremely rare for a police officer to get convicted of, uh, of a crime in Cook County, and it's also extremely rare for them to be fired. And, and remember, the police superintendent, Eddie Johnson, recommended that these firings happen. So it may indicate that there's no, not going to be any business as usual in, in the police department. Z Xavier Pope, is this lasting change, you think? It, it may be lasting change, but this is, isn't over. The officers can still appeal through the court system mm -hmm. in terms of this decision by the police board. Uh, I think that this is a seminal time in our city. And I think that this sends a message that if you are a bad cop, then you will be paying the cost. Um, and I, I think that especially when you see the wranglings between Tony Pretwinkle and a lawyer like for our mayor, that that's going to bas basically put that right in front and center in terms of what happens next here. And basically, well, the because, because your, your point about that is, is well taken because there's this issue of the code of silence, yep. which Tony Preckwinkle made an issue of during the campaign and said that Eddie Johnson would not acknowledge that. He says that he has, but they, there's still a lot of resistance, I think, in the, cultural resistance, cultural. I think, in the police department. And the to, the to police union is basically saying this decision should be taken out of the hands of the police board and go to arbitration. Explain what they're talking about there. Well, they essentially want to take it to court, like Xavier said. They want essentially a judge to rule that the police board acted inappropriately or considered evidence that they shouldn't have. And they certainly have every right to do that. The, that's provided under their contract with the city. The real fight is going to be what this next contract looks like. The police have been working without a contract for two full years now and uh, there is going to be huge pressure on Lori Lightfoot to put together a contract that ups these uh, penalties for bad cops and so that they 
can be held accountable for, for bad behavior. Greg Pratt, you're at City Hall every day. Do you see any scenario where these two sides are going to agree on some kind of labor contract? Well, they're going to have to at some point, right? But the it, it's a fascinating thing because there's there's core issues that, that matter to police officers like pay, like their safety, like their, their mental health, their benefits. And then you have a very activist police leadership that is very police union leadership, which is very right wing. They're extreme. You know, I don't know that they this is an exaggeration, but they may not even believe police misconduct exists. Well, they've taken this kind of us against the world attitude. I think they feel in this climate that everybody is against them and, and they've taken they've kind of dug in their heels. Um, R. Kelly is dug in his heels on a defense now, but he's facing federal charges. Is this the end of the road for R. Kelly? Well, many people believe that he's never going to step out of jail again. You know, he, he, was not, he was not allowed to, have, to bond himself out on, the, on these recent, most recent charges. And the, there are many, many more victims uh, waiting to testify against him. There's, uh, the, uh, the, the other side alleges that they, they have maybe four tapes, very incriminating tapes. So it's, it's looking like it's going to be a very long haul for him. And, and now today he's going to have to go to appear in New York for another arraignment. That's right, because he's also facing charges in New York. He's accused of bringing underage girls to New York for uh, illicit sexual contact. What struck me, though, is that we learned this week that the victim in the 2008 trial is apparently co cooperating with authorities. And of course, she testified that it wasn't her and that she wasn't involved and that R. Kelly mm. hadn't done anything wrong. And I think if there's any lasting legacy of the Me Too movement, that change, I think, is p perhaps emblematic and of Part it. of the charges here are obstruction of justice because right. he's accused yes. of, of paying these people for their silence. Absolutely. I think part of the, 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 the young lady who did not testify in 2008, what does she know? And they talk about some of the, the victims coercing other, other young girls to do different things. So that maybe is part of this as well, about what does she know and what are other people that she, uh, she's connected to knows as well. So how do these federal charges differ from the charges that uh, state's attorney Kim Fox brought? Well, part of what the, the federal charges deal with is the, is the allegation that they more or less fixed the case back in 2008, which was just the underlying right sex offenses, and this is that they were obstructing and messing with that. And it's pretty staggering to think about that after... 11 years we're finding out that what people suspected which is that they did some hinky stuff to to get that result and just think about how many people uh wouldn't have been molested allegedly if uh if they had gotten it right the first time is kim fox going to have to fold her case into the federal case or acquiesce to them or are these cases going to go forward on separate well, tracks? The federal cases, uh, the federal cases in, in, on the East Coast are different jurisdictions. Yeah. But, but in general, uh, if you're in, in the same jurisdiction, the, the state's attorney would either work with or, or cooperate. You, you saw that happen with the Laquan McDonald case. The, there had to be certain, the Laquan McDonald had to be prosecuted before these other officers. So I think it's the same principle would operate here. The feds are just better at what they do than, than locals are. And I'm not and just talking resources. about. Yeah. yeah and they're, they're better and they have more resources than you have two feds in this case. You know, they may bring it, but I don't, I don't know that that's necessary. And I would, I would uh, not, uh, I'd be remiss if we don't uh, pay hom homage to Jim, Jim DeRogaitis De De of the Sun-Times, who is a crack investigator reporter who had, had, had a major role in yeah. keeping the heat on and getting many of these young women to come forward. Kept on this for years, no doubt. Before we leave the legal beat, uh, Justice John Paul Stevens, former Supreme Court Justice, dies. He is a Chicago native. Uh, Laura Washington, what's his lasting legacy on the Supreme Court? Well, he was considered a, a, fair, a, a fair, fair above all fairness. Um, his father had been unjustly convicted um, when he was a young man, and I think that that, that colored his, his view of the justice system. My favorite thing about him is that he's a, a South Sider, grew up as a South Sider, but he was a Cubs, a Cubs fan, fan, just like me. So, uh, a, and he apparently was at uh, the game that Babe Ruth allegedly called his shot. So, and, he, and he said in a piece that we aired that he always retained his love of the Chicago Cubs and Chicago sports. Uh, Heather Sherrill, we're all Chicago natives here. I mean, what, what does he mean to the legacy of Chicago? Well, what's interesting is that uh, President Gerald Ford, who of course appointed him to the Supreme Court, said that he would be glad to be remembered for nothing else other than appointing him to the Supreme Court. And I think that speaks to his lasting legacy, of leading the liberal uh, wing of the court that is no longer in ascendance. When, as he said, he said he didn't change, he felt the court moved. E exactly. I, I feel like his lasting legacy is his independence. He, from case to case, he decided on a case to case basis 
had very these nuanced opinions, decided to take on maybe be the lone judge sometimes to dissent and had these interesting dissents that were separate from the court. So I think that his independence and his nuance will definitely be part of his legacy. All right, let's move on to some political news. Lightfoot and Preckwick will battle each other over city violence. Immigration and customs enforcement raids fizzle out as aldermen and activists remain vigilant. Three American children mistakenly detained at O'Hare by ICE. Lightfoot's ethics reform package is one step closer to reality. And another FBI raid on a Mike Madigan confidant as a speaker rakes in major cash from lawmakers just in July, ostensibly for legal bills. But let's go back to Lightfoot and Preckwickle. What's at the heart of this war of words here? They don't like each other at <laughs> all. They can't stand each other. And of course, we know how heated and how difficult the campaign was. Right now, they're debating the issue of criminal justice in, in Cook County and whether or not uh, Preckwinkle's advocacy for bail reform is, is uh, putting more dangerous criminals out on the streets. And Lori Lightfoot and Eddie Johnson have alluded to that. Preckwinkle wrote a letter uh, objecting to that line of reasoning uh, earlier this week. and That was directed to Mayor Lightfoot, but somehow got somehow into the got press the really public. quickly, too. And Lori Lightfoot did not hesitate when she came back from New York uh, responding to it. And starting out with a very political st comment that it's, it's July, it's not March, get over it, you lost the election. <laughs> but then going on to, to, to make the case that, that maybe there's some, qu we, we need to raise some questions well, about Well, both sides are putting problem. forward these statistics. Preckwinkle says, um, you know, people don't get released on bail and, and commit crimes again. Lightfoot says, no, a lot of the people the CPD is picking up are because they were released from jail so early. Where's the truth here, Greg? Well, that's... Uh the numbers, the court is hard to get numbers from, real numbers, because the chief judge keeps releasing numbers, but they're his numbers and they're very limited. So it's not like they did a real study, it's just they, they did a, their own review. It hasn't been outside scrutinized. But I think they both have a point where the, the armed offenders get in trouble, people who should not have guns, people who are, are they're getting UUWs, unlawful use of a weapon, and they're getting let out, and they're getting let out in a day or two. Sometimes and, and the, the point the mayor made is that UUW is not a felony in Cook County, or kind of or depends. They're not counting it as a violent crime. I think was her point, right. and 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 it is right. And it, if it's if it's not literally a violent crime, it speaks to it. You get some felon who has shot people before with a gun, that's a problem. Now, on the other hand, you shouldn't be locking people up because they were shoplifting or something. Heather Sharon, is there a political component to what Preckwinkle did this week? Sure. Um, State's Attorney Kim Fox is going to face a very difficult re-election campaign in 2020, and she's really been the face of this bond reform effort. Tony Preckwinkle is very close to State's Attorney Kim Fox. So when Lori Lightfoot says, hey, they're letting too many violent criminals out on the street, it, it, it's a bank shot against Kim Fox. And I you know, believe that Tony Preckwinkle not only wanted to stick up for her reforms, but also for Kim Fox. One of, one of the things I enjoy about this is sort of the strange bedfellows, where Preckwinkle right. and the chief judge, who they hate each other. she ran against him for Alderman and lost twice and then finally beat him, and then Lightfoot and the FOP are on the same side somehow. It's kind of amusing. Boy, those are strange alliances. Xavier, how does this get resolved, do you think? Uh, I think this gets resolved not anytime soon. <laughs> I think you'll see. Maybe over the, the two of them can come on here together and talk it out. Hopefully they can talk it out over, over <laughs> anything there's, else. Then there's a lot of, I think, uh, I think Fred Quinkle in her letter said, we should get together, we should talk, we should work together. They're both talking about working together, but uh, they're talking of, uh, across each yeah, other. If, if, if one says I'm going to be above this issue and then turns around b behind that and says something against the other, then this is going to continue to spiral and keep going. All right, Greg Pratt, let's talk about what happened at O'Hare yesterday. Was this a mistake by customs and enforcement officials that, that detained these three Mexican minors who, I'm sorry, they're, I mean, they're American citizens. They were coming from Mexico. What exactly happened? Well, that's a horrific story. Just, just when you think about the implications of it, where you have some people coming in, they're U.S. citizens, they, they have, uh, they're a mixed status family, you know, so their, their family is undocumented. Somehow the person that they're with isn't allowed to come in with them, and then they're holding them there for 13 hours, and a congresswoman, by coincidence, shows up. And think about the people that don't have that. Uh, but but they, they were there and they were told, so the story that, that Border Patrol says is we wanted a parent to come pick them up. The story that the activists say is that they wanted a parent to come pick them up so that they could take them away. So they were entrapping them because the parent was undocumented. Yeah, they were using the children as a lure. Now, whether that's true or not, who knows, right? But, what do but we it, think that public, I mean, you said Jan Schakowsky, the congresswoman got involved, Governor Pritzker, Mayor Lightfoot. What did they tell them to get this resolved? 
That's a, that's a good question. We saw Lori Lightfoot say, hey, thank you to Border Patrol. I appreciate your help here. Um, what was interesting to me that was that there was no hesitation on Governor Pritzker's part or Mayor Lori Lightfoot's part to get involved with this, that there was no longer the benefit of the doubt given to Customs and Border Patrol that somehow this wasn't at least something suspicious going on that necessitated them to get involved right away. I don't know that that would have happened six months ago when a lot of these issues were still, um, people weren't sure exactly what was going on with the federal government and immigration. I think President Trump's threats have really sort of moved us past that. People still aren't sure. Xavier Pope, why do you think these threats of deportations and ICE actions failed to materialize, at least in Chicago this week? Well, I just think that you see, you've seen with Alderman speaking directly to streets and sanitation workers, letting them know, hey, if you find, if you know, see ICE agents to, to notify the Alderman. And I think that the city has been just pushing back in general on this. And I think that that's why it hasn't uh, taken hold. I right. think it's also had its impact. They, they, it was designed to intimidate and scare uh, immigrants, and, it, and people were not going out on the street. People were afraid to go through their daily lives. And what you hear in the community is some folks are thinking of either they're thinking about not coming if they're in Mexico and want to come here, or they're thinking about going back because they'd, they'd rather go back voluntarily than be, being deported. And that's, I think, what the federal government wants. One theory some folks have is that perhaps ICE is luring them into some kind of sense of complacency. Well, it didn't happen last week, and so they're going to get complacent, and then something happens in the middle of the night. We just don't know what's going to happen. Um, Greg Pratt, tell us quickly about the ethics packages that passed committee uh, in city council this week. So the, the mayor is trying to get her first signature win, which is about the ethics reform, and she's trying to get through a package that largely cribs from the Board of Ethics, although it softens some things, like it softens uh, fines on, it increases fines from where they are now, which is really low, laughably low right. uh, for, for violations, and it increases it just a little, uh, and it expands the powers of the Inspector General, which is interesting because the, the aldermen fought that like crazy a few years ago, and it looks oh. likely they're not. There was one alderman yeah, in particular yeah, 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 that yeah, yeah. led the charge against that. His name is Ed Burke, and I saw him twisting arms behind the scenes, making sure that wasn't going to happen. Heather Sharon, will it pass the full city council? I think it will be very difficult for an alderman to vote no uh, in this day and age and era of repeated FBI raids on multiple and assorted aldermen for any untold number of reasons. Uh, in addition to giving the inspector general authority over the city council, uh, they will also ban aldermen from working as attorneys in adverse court cases of the city. So that could potentially make it impossible for Ed Burke to continue to work as a property tax attorney. Uh, Alderman Patrick Daly Thompson is also a property tax we attorney. We spoke on this uh, on WBZ this morning though, we Heather. Did. Ed Burke, you know, owns or is a partner in that law firm. It doesn't mean other par other uh, lawyers in that firm can't get the business. I'm, we don't know. I'm looking forward to the Chicago Board of Ethics decision to, on to, that one. To see what they say about it. Okay, let's move on to some other city news. Lori Lightfoot pitches possible casino locations, surprising some aldermen. The Humboldt Park alligator dub chance to snap or snagged by a Florida man who becomes an instant Chicago celebrity. I mean, this guy's celebrity is just going on and on and on. And an oppressive heat wave rolls into uh, Chicago. Um, Lori Lightfoot, I'm sorry, Laura Washington, um, why are some aldermen now pushing back on some of these possible casino locations? Well, because for one thing, I think Lori Lightfoot made a, what appears to be a rookie mistake in that she didn't consult, she didn't inform them that, that she'd made the decision and she was going to announce it. And two aldermen in particular, Sophia King and uh, Pat Dow on the south side, those two of the sites are in their wards and they don't want them. Yeah. And they, they were very vocal right after the announcement was made about saying that. Um, she, life would have saying this is just preliminary. We have five sites. There might be other sites. We're not ruling out downtown, but um, it sounds like she's got some work to do in terms of uh, feeling out her. These are her automatic allies in, in terms of feeling them out and, and seeing. Well, does this signal there's going to be pushback to this notion that a casino is going to be an economic development boon for a struggling neighborhood? I don't know that that's what that signifies. I think uh, you know, in the case of in the case of the Dowell site. You know, she's got plans for this. She, Pat Dowell, yeah, third ward. she wants a, a Pete's Fresh Market there. The Sophia King site at the old Michael Reese Hospital, that's potentially a good site, and that's potentially something where they run over her. Well, Sophia King has done a lot of homework, especially with her constituents, in terms of hearings and meetings, and she's saying that her that her constituents are, are firmly against it. Yeah, so. they, they are. Uh, I think I think it's objectively true that they are against it, mm -hmm. but if somebody wants it there, that's, that's where it's going well, to happen. Especially if that big, happens to be Lori Lightfoot. Well, the big <laughs> issue is that they're in south, the south and west sides, predominantly black neighborhoods, where 
like Alderman Mike Scott, been wanting to have various investments in those communities for years. And the only thing that's going to draw attention in terms of investment is a casino. Um, that's something that, what, what does that say about those neighborhoods? Yeah. Is that though there that's aren't a the, lot of other options yeah. right now? Well, they need, there needs to be other right. options because the, the city is investing in all, all types of other neighborhoods we're seeing going on. And Mike Scott, you know, the West Side, he wanted the Obama library uh, yeah. there too. He lost out the South Side. All right, Xavier, why did this uh, gator trapper named Frank uh, <laughs> Rob uh, become such an instant celebrity? I mean, he's, he's throwing out the pitch at the Cubs game. He's turning on Buckingham Fountain. He's going to get a key to the city. He's probably going to parachute from the Willis Tower or something. I mean, what, what's going on here? You know, I think it's the, the, the celebrity of Florida Man. When some, <laughs> something weird happens, it's Florida Man, right? And so we get Florida Man right here to catch a gator uh, and Chance the Snapper. Everywhere I went during these days, everyone just talked about this alligator. And so this man, right off the gate, comes out and gets the alligator, and I think that's why he's been uh, such a huge celebrity. I give him a lot of credit, but, it would, but I hate that we have to import our heroes. We have to bring in say, somebody from Florida. Bob. What about alligator Bob? Does, does this Bob? mean alligator he Bob wasn't from good sight. at what he was doing? He wasn't good. Yeah. He didn't catch the alligator. Yeah. Well, you know, I think part of that was that the city should have recognized much earlier on that you couldn't have that commotion, you couldn't have it be a, yeah. a tourist to scene the at the park. And, and, and once they closed the park, the next day... The gator the, bobbed the, up out of the water. He was scared to death. We didn't know. It was Illinois, not Florida, where gators are. Learning. We're learning as we go here, and all he did was use a fishing rod and a lure and a net. Yeah. Well, Alligator Bob was kind of a silly character, you know, like, and I don't know if <laughs> any of you... Name. Any of you were there, I went there, I saw him. He would show up in his canoe and say, I don't want any attention and just go immediately to talk to the reporters. <laughs> and so, that was uh, his full-time job was talking yeah. to the press. Laura, quickly, um, 95 was a deadly heat wave. We've got another heat wave coming on. Do you think the city's learned its lesson? More than 700 people died in that heat wave. Is the city better prepared these days? Well, if you saw the full court press, the, the mayor and every head of every major city agency in, in town did the other day in terms of informing the public, providing prop, uh, cooling centers, providing all kinds of services. We didn't have that, that kind of uh, attention at the time. And you got to think about the communications. Now we have apps, we have the internet, we have all kinds of ways for people to get the word out, to get the word in to places where people are in need. So I think that the, the, the times have changed and, and we just learned a lot of lessons. I from think that it's area. important the, the city is, is over prepared, right? Because the how it's not under, that hot. It's not that hot. <laughs> and, and, and that heat wave lasted much, days. much, much longer yeah. before. But, you know, there's right. this documentary that came out that showed Mayor Daley and how kind of on his heels he was when the death toll started rising. And I'm sure politicians like snowstorms, heat waves, they don't want to be caught unaware. All right, let's move on to sports. Cubs move pitcher Mike Montgomery and pickup catcher Martin Maldonado. Will the Sox oust Rick Renneria as his team struggles after the All-Star break? The Blackhawks trade 31-year-old Artem Anisimov for 31-year-old Zach Smith and 200,000 petitions are delivered to the U.S. Soccer Federation here in Chicago, demanding equal pay for women. Xavier Pope, what did the Cubs get for Mike Montgomery? Well, they, they, they got a, a catcher. They have Wilson Contreras that's, that's out, and they, they need to be able to uh, have that, stir up that position. You know, you want to have someone to be able to, to catch the ball. And so, How long is Contreras out for? Uh, it's it's it's, it's ongoing. It, it kind of cha changes day by day. And so we don't know how long he'll be out, maybe for an extended period of time, have to have someone in that position. And the, and the Cubs have done really well after the All-Star break. Do you yeah. think they're getting it in gear for the second half? I think so. I think the, the, the Cubs are hitting the ball right now. And I think that um, we even see you, Darvish, actually pitching better. He won a game. <laughs> he won a game in the really field. <laughs> Small so, steps. <laughs> Small eight. Hey, anything that counts, right? Well, it's like, they were saying it's like acquiring a pitcher at the deadline is getting a good you, Darvish. Um, on the other side of town, the White Sox are missing Tim Anderson and Eloy Jimenez. Are they, are they kind of tanking without them? Yeah, they kind of are. I mean, lose seven straight after the All-Star break. Um, they were two games behind the wild card before the All-Star break, and now we see them, them sliding. And, and um, what's going to happen now, I, I, don't, I don't necessarily know, but um, they, they're not looking so good right now. What do you make of this petition effort for the U.S. women's soccer team? Have they really struck a chord on the equal pay issue? I think it absolutely struck a chord. I think that the, this, this team has galvanized this country in terms of how uh, boisterous they've been about um, equal pay and I think that this is a huge movement and I think they will not only impact soccer though this will impact outside of soccer and 
whether it's accounting, whether it's whether it's 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 in the, the boardrooms, it doesn't matter. I think that this is something that's bigger than sports. Heather Sharon, how do you see this issue uh, continuing on now that the World Cup is over? Well, I think that players like uh, uh, Megan Rapinoe and Alex Morgan uh, show us a different version of female sports excellence, yep. and it's not one that we have seen since the last World Cup victory by the women's by the women. sports uh, or women's soccer team, um, and. Um, um, I know as a mom of two little girls, I was glad to be able to point to them and say, look, you can do it. Were they into the, the, the they team? They are swimmers. They yeah. were not really into it, but I tried to push them because, you know, I brainwashed them. That's part of my job. <laughs> well, you have not brainwashed any of us. You've just given great information, but we're out of time. Heather Sharon, Greg Pratt, Laura Washington, Xavier Pope, thank you all for being here. And today, Mayor Lightfoot rejected a deal to have a private company operate the Chicago ports. Read about that on our website in a follow-up to a story that we first brought you on Wednesday. And we'll see you on the next edition of the Week in Review. I'm Paris Schutz. Heather Sharon, Man Beyond the Beach, this festival that was going to be on Montrose uh, Beach is now gone. Uh, what happened? Because of the endangered piping pluffer. 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 And uh, they can't hatch and grow up with all sorts of electronic music and teens and all sorts of craziness. So we'll see if they're able to relocate somewhere Well, we, else. we had the, the organizer, Jam Production, on the show. They said they were pro plover, so I guess they, I mean, they've, <laughs> they've proven it. Is it's this... really the summer of cute exotic animals in Chicago. Yeah, the animals are having their revenge yeah. here in Chicago. <laughs> Watch it just die in the heat wave. Oh, no. oh, oh Greg. Oh, yeah, you know the well, then, 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 then maybe they'll have Mambi back on. Who knows? That's nature. You're going to get a well, lot they, of email. They have a lot of protectors out there. I think they have a lot of they do. I'm not yeah. taking care of them. So I th are they going to relocate them to the shade, maybe, if it gets too hot? One would hope they would know to go toward the shade. Yeah. I don't know. Well, they're babies. They're know. chicks. Yeah. Yeah. Is this yeah, in their DNA? Exactly. Yeah, I don't know. We didn't get to that black one. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices. Robert Clifford is the honoree of this year's Illinois Bar Foundation's annual fundraising event that raises money to enhance the availability of justice for those without attorneys throughout the state.